This is the story of Brit Air Flight 5672. Now, Brit Air might not be a carrier that you might be too familiar with, but on the 22nd of June 2003, the airline was operating a CRJ100ER for Air France from the city of Nantes, France, to also Brest in France. The plane took off from Nantes at 9.16 p.m. with just 21 people on board. The first flight of the day had been delayed, and so this flight was delayed by 15 minutes as well. Once in the air, the plane made its way towards Brest. The pilots rerouted the plane around a weather formation, keeping the plane away from the worst of the weather. As flight 5672 was in the air, the weather at Brest was not the best. Visibility hovered at around 800 meters or about 2,600 feet. As time went on, the plane was allowed to descend from 15,000 feet and then 7,000 feet. As they made their way down towards 7,000 feet, the pilots were aiming to get the plane on a waypoint known as Bodol. This was the initial approach fix for the approach to runway 26, and as they did that, they avoided storms to the left and right of them. As the plane made its way towards Brest, it looked like the controller would put the plane into a hold so that a plane ahead of the CRJ could land safely. But just as they were about to start the hold, the plane in front of them landed safely, landing on runway 26. The landing for flight 5672 was a go. In the cockpit, the heading and vertical speed modes were activated and the displays displayed the VOR frequencies for runway 26. With the approach underway, the pilots brought the flaps out slowly as the strong winds pummeled the airplane from the left. With that, the controller cleared the plane for landing and told the pilots that the cloud base was at 100 feet. This meant that the pilots would only see the runway at the very end of their approach. With everything looking okay, the plane began the final descent that would take it all the way down to the runway. At 9.50 p.m., the captain said, Approach selected, LOC and glide. Then the automated voice in the cockpit called out 500, indicating that they were just 500 feet off of the ground. This call out was more or less expected, but the next one caught them off guard. It said, Glide slope, sink rate. The plane was basically telling them that they were not on the glide slope and that they were sinking too fast. Basically, in simple terms, if they kept this up, they would not land on the runway but instead they would fly their plane right into the French countryside. In response to these warnings, the plane was put into a right bank, but the rate of descent was not really addressed. As the automated systems continued to call out glide slope, glide slope, it also let them know that they were just 300 feet off the ground. The first officer was saying, come to the right, come to the right, in an attempt to get the plane lined up with the runway. That didn't really work, and the plane continued to lose altitude. 100, said the automated voice. But the time to do something about the state of the plane was starting to run out. The runway did not materialize in front of them, and the pilots were confused. The first officer said, I got nothing in front. The captain, now realizing the gravity of the situation, called for a go-around. He just said, go around, go around. As the call for the go-around was made, power to the engines was increased. But it was too little, too late. The CRJ ended up crashing short of the runway. The plane had gone through a wooden embankment and a shallow pond. The plane eventually burst into flames. The survivors of the crash moved away from the wreck, but for some reason their calls were not taken seriously by the people in charge of the emergency services. Despite the violent crash and the subsequent destruction of the plane, the crash was dubbed as a miracle by the French media. The French media christened it as the miracle in Brest because of the 24 people on board 23 people survived, and looking at the wreck of the plane, you would not have expected anyone to survive. But most people did, although five people did have serious injuries. Something that might have caused more people to survive was the willingness of the locals to help out. Once the plane had crashed and burst into flames, people from nearby came to the crash site and helped the wounded survivors to get away from the burning wreck of the plane. With the plane in a smoldering pile of ash that was barely recognizable as a plane anymore, the investigators turned to the terrain and the environment to get an idea as to how the CRJ jet came down. The first point of impact was in a field, and the undercarriage took most of the impact. You know what? Calling it an impact is very generous as the touchdown was very light. Had the plane landed on a runway, and not a field, then this would have been a very normal landing. But that is not what happened. Digging into the mystery more, the CVR gave them a treasure trove of information. You see, this was their fourth flight of the day, and the captain and the first officer were starting to fall into a routine. This was made evident by the fact that the pilots did not really go through a full arrival briefing, 
After doing them over and over again, sometimes many times a day, they may seem redundant and even boring, but they make sure that both pilots are on the same page about the approach, how things should be done, and so forth. This allows errors to be caught and corrected before it snowballs into a massive crisis. Remember how the other plane needed to land and how Flight 5672 was almost put into a hold? Well, as that happened, the cockpit was a very busy place. When the controller realized that Flight 5672 would not have to hold, she just said, you continue the approach. Now, instead of putting the plane into a hold, they had to reconfigure the plane to land. This resulted in a flurry of activity. The pilots changed the plane over to the heading mode. The ILS became active and the navigation source was changed from the FMS to the VOR. Now, it's okay if you don't really understand what all of that means. Just know that these actions are needed so that the plane can follow the ILS beacon right down to the runway. Well, all of these steps and one more. One step that the pilots did not do at this point. They forgot to hit the approach switch, which would have armed the approach mode. The approach mode is the mode that actually makes the plane fly towards the runway by following the beacon, and the non-arming of the approach mode was a massive, massive oversight on the part of the pilots. But how could two experienced pilots make such a mistake? The investigators had two theories. The cockpit was a busy environment, the captain was busy reprogramming the plane, and the fact of arming the approach switch might have just slipped his mind. The other theory is that he was waiting for the plane to stabilize at 2,000 feet. He was like, I'll do it later, and then just forgot to do it. Either way, his actions had devastating consequences. The plane now was at the mercy of the winds. Had the plane been in approach mode, the plane would have followed the beam right down to the runway. But since it was in heading mode, it would only keep the runway heading. Therefore, the winds could push the plane off course onto a course that is parallel to the runway. And that is what happened. If you look at the crash site relative to the runway, you can see that it's mostly parallel to the runway. The track of the plane shows the exact same thing as well. From this point on, no one in the cockpit, at least for a while, detected the drift of the plane. They were in a dangerous situation. The thing is, the controller at this point was searching for the plane on her radar screen, but she could not find it as the plane was in an area where radar coverage was the weakest. Then, as the approach went on, the first officer noticed that they were not on glide. He had been configuring the plane for landing and was talking to control. When he got back to scanning his instruments, he knew that something was off. The pilots noticed that they were well above the glide slope. Remember, the plane was set to stay at 2,000 feet, and the approach mode was not enabled. So the captain used the vertical speed mode to get back on glide. He was fixing the vertical positioning of the plane, but not the horizontal positioning of the plane. The fact that the pilots were using the vertical speed to manage the plane and the vertical axis is proof that the pilots knew that they were in the heading mode, but somehow no one detected that they were drifting away from the runway. I mean, the first officer even asks, quote, you're getting it back, do you want me to put the approach on for you? End quote. But he declines as he's just too busy managing the descent of the plane. All this while the flight director was centered and it probably made the captain think that they were lined up with the runway. Then something insidious happened. The captain, at long last, hit the approach button. But due to the plane being outside the capture envelope, the approach mode did not enable. And now, the pilots think that they've done everything needed to land this plane successfully, but in reality, they've just given themselves a false sense of security. But all was not lost. Right before impact, the first officer noticed that something was seriously wrong, and he said, come right, to the captain. Seeing the localizer diamond so far to the right drove the point home to the captain that the plane was in danger and that the plane was nowhere where he thought it would be. The captain started turning to the right in an attempt to get the plane back on the correct path. But the plane still kept falling. With just 100 feet to go, the captain called for a go-around. The throttles were increased, but the elevators are just less efficient at low airspeed. This meant that it would take longer for the plane to respond. But time is something that they just did not have. That sealed the fate of Flight 5672. At that point, there was no going back. The plane was going to touch down regardless of what the pilots did. They were no longer pilots and was just along for the ride just like everyone else. Like I alluded to before, this crash was known as the miracle in Brest. Do you agree with that? Is this a crash that you expected multiple people to walk away from? 
let me know in the comments below. If you want to see a version of this accident where the plane did not crash, I have a video of that on my channel right now. You can find it on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.